So uh, today, you know, in past years, I've come in here and shown you a lot of ugly looking pictures of arteries and hearts and things that are, you know, none of us want to have. And I, I thought I would change it up a little bit this year. And I, I want to concentrate a little bit on what's normal. So in clinic, a lot of the times, I mean, I'll hear this question. Hey, doc, my, my heart rate's so-and-so. Is that normal? <laughs> my cholesterol's whatever. Is that normal? So I want to talk a little bit about what's normal and maybe a series of numbers that if you don't know them about yourself, this may help you to kind of go, oh, that's normal, or help you to recognize when something's not normal. So I've, I've called it today, Know Your Numbers. And what we're gonna concentrate on is these six things. We're gonna talk about your heart rate, what's a normal heart rate, what's abnormal, how, do, how should I know when I need to do something about my heart rate. Uh, we definitely are gonna concentrate on blood pressure. We're gonna to touch on cholesterol. Now, I'm not really a diabetes doctor. I see a lot of patients who are diabetic because diabetes is such a risk factor for heart disease. But I will not say that I'm any sort of expert in, di in diabetes, particularly with all the new medicines that are on the market now. But there is a particular number that, particularly if you're diabetic, you need to know. And then these other two are kind of um, things that we talk about in the clinic. One's called your ejection fraction, which I think you'll actually recognize that when we talk about it. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what's the size of your aorta supposed to be. So let's start with heart rate. Um, so a normal heart rate is generally felt to be 60 to 100 beats per minute. Anywhere in there, it's considered to be normal. Now, I have a lot of patients whose heart rate, their resting heart rate is in the 50s, and that's fine too. But if you look in the book, it says 60 to 100. So how do you check your heart rate? So the, the, the way that we usually do it is we take your pulse. So you can find your pulse right here on your wrist. That's your radial artery. You can actually find it here in your carotid artery. Don't hold both carotids at the same time. That's not a good idea. The other place you can sometimes feel it right here in front of your earlobe, uh, or this little part of your ear, uh, you can feel your pulse there. So what you can do, if you want to count for a minute, set the clock for a minute and count how many beats you've got. Most people just count it for 15 seconds and multiply times four. But that's how you find out what your heart rate is. Now your predicted maximal heart rate, so people will ask me frequently, how high should my heart rate get when I exercise? How high is too high? So the predicted, uh, can I go back? Is there a back button here? Back? Can I go back? Yeah, that'd be great. So the predicted maximal heart rate is 220 minus your age. So if you're 20 years old, your predicted heart rate, maximum heart rate is 200. So you can use that as a guide when you, when you exercise. The older we get, the lower is your maximum heart rate. Very important. There's a wide variability. Your wife's heart rate is 60. Yours is 90. You're both normal. You're both okay. So don't compare your heart rate to somebody else's. Like I said, I have patients that have resting heart rates in the 50s. And they feel great, and everything's fine with that. So um, it, it, let's, don't put it all in stone, but 60 or 100 to 100, even down into the 50s is okay. Now, the other more modern way that people now are checking their heart rate is with one of these. So one of these uh, fancy watches that you can get, they'll, uh, they'll check your heart rate, they'll give, some of them will even give you your EKG and all these kind of things. And so. We, we now have lots of people coming into the office and say, hey, here, look at my watch. Is that normal? And so we can even get EKGs with it. Now I'm not saying you need to run off and invest in some fancy technology, but there are other ways to check it. Uh, putting your fingers right here and counting it for 15 seconds is a lot cheaper than that. So why can there be variations of normal? So 
a lot of it can depend on your fitness level. So if you take a, a like a runner, a marathon runner, and you go sit them in a chair for a little while, their resting heart rate might be 40. And that's normal for them because they're in such good shape and their heart rate is, and their heart is so efficient. So if you're somewhat out of shape, your heart rate's gonna be a little higher. So let's say you started an exercise program and your resting heart rate was 80, and now after you've been exercising a while, it's, it's 65. Perfect, normal, that's normal. So your fitness level can definitely affect your heart rate. The other thing that can affect heart rate are medicines that we take particularly drugs like beta blockers, all the alols, metoprolol, bisoprolol, carbetalol. Those will all tend to slow your heart rate down some. And sometimes we do that because we want your heart rate to be a little bit slower. And then also people that have had rhythm problems will be on, can be on a series of medications to help keep their heart in rhythm, but it will also slow your heart down. And then certainly people can kind of have persistently high heart rates if they have high if they have rhythm problems to their heart. Atrial fibrillation is one of the most common ones where we'll see a little bit faster heart rate than you would expect if you weren't in that rhythm. All right, so when should I worry? I think that's where we want to get down to. So if your heart rate is persistently all the time, no matter what you do, greater than 100 beats per minute, doesn't mean you're sick, but you should at least ask your doctor about it. Hey, why does my heart rate seem to always be over 100? I actually have a few patients, young patients, who have persistent heart rates over 100, and that's just how they're built. So it's not necessarily that you've got some bad disease, but if your heart rate's kind of living over 100 beats per minute all the time, at least ask your doctor about it. Now, certainly a normal heartbeat should be regular. It should be like music. You can tap your foot to it, all right? Your regular heartbeat. If you have an irregular heartbeat, that's abnormal. You need to get that checked out. Now, just because you have an irregular heartbeat doesn't mean that you have atrial fibrillation. There's other reasons to have irregular heartbeats, but, if you find that your heart beats irregular, and where a lot of people see it is when they take their blood pressure and then there's a little indicator down there on the screen and it says irregular heartbeat. So that's when you probably need to come to the doctor and at least get an EKG to make you see why you have an irregular heartbeat. Certainly, if your heartbeat is irregular and you start passing out, uh, we need to talk about that, okay? So people that pass out most commonly pass out, let me start that over. If your heart causes you to pass out, it's usually because of too slow a heart rate. Now, you can get your heart going fast enough to where you pass out, but it's, it's more uncommon from a fast heart rate. When your fast heart's rate really fast, you'll feel it beating in there and you'll feel faint, you won't feel good, but you won't pass out all the way. If you just flat pass out, that you need to check with your doctor about that, okay? So, always ask your, heart, your doctor about slow heart rates. Sometimes we want you there. Sometimes we're forcing you to be heart rate of 50, because maybe you'll have less chest pain. Maybe it'll keep you out of atrial fibrillation. So there are many, many people with slow heart rates that feel fine, and it's okay. But you should ask your doctor and say, hey, is this okay where my heart rate's living? Okay? So, blood pressure. Another thing we all kind of think about and worry about here in the room. So remember, your blood pressure is a moving target, okay? Your blood pressure is not a static number. If you check your blood pressure right now and check it in five minutes, you're gonna get a little bit of a different number. The idea of blood pressure is to check multiple times, and we like to look at the trend, not at any one particular blood pressure reading. So lots of variability uh, in your blood pressure, depending on what you're doing, what's been going on that day, what's been in your diet. And you say, how should I check it? Well, the gold standard is still this. So that's a kind of a blood pressure cuff 
with the old-fashioned dial on it and a stethoscope. The, the official name for that device right there is a sphygmo manometer, but we just call it a blood pressure cuff. But this is what we generally use in the office. Um, certainly there's all kinds of electronic equipment we use now too, but this is really, if you really want to get your best number, this is the best thing to use. Now certainly, probably these type of things for people in the room are somewhat uh, familiar. If you go to the drugstore, you can get a, uh, they've become super easy. You get a cuff, you get the little machine here, and really all you have to do is push the button. It keeps it, all the numbers in the memory for you so that when you come to the doctor, you can show them what you've been doing. And then they, they sell a similar device here, which is more of a, a, wrist, a wrist cuff. So, how do we take our blood pressure? This actually is really, really important, okay? The time to take your blood pressure is not after you've just gone to the Walmart, walked around it for two hours, carried 14 grocery bags up your stairs, hey, I'm gonna go check my blood pressure right now. That's not the time, all right? We wanna sit with both of our feet on the floor. Or you can even like relax back on a couch if you want to. Relax, relax, relax. Give your blood pressure a chance to kind of come back down to where it normally should live. Really, it's recommended that you wait five to 15 minutes of rest time prior to taking your blood pressure reading, okay? So if we go, oh my gosh, I was supposed to take my blood pressure at two o'clock and it's 2.02 and you rush off and go get it, your blood pressure is gonna be a little higher than normal, okay? So, if you have one of the fancy Sphygmo manometers with the little bulb on it, and you're taking your own, don't blow up the bulb in the same hand that the, that the cuff's on. It happens, trust me. So you're gonna sit here doing all this work with that bulb, and then wonder why your blood pressure's up. This one I cannot emphasize enough. Use the proper size cuff, okay? So if you use a little tiny kid's cuff on your arm, uh, and you have an arm like me, it's, A, it's not gonna go around there, but B, it's gonna read too high. Similarly, if you have small arms and you use too large of a cuff, it will measure too low. So you wanna make sure that the cuff fits comfortably on your arm and that you get the right size because you will consistently have numbers that are off if your cuff is not the right size. For most people, a regular adult cuff works. But for some of us, we need the extra large, the big boy cuff, I like to call it. And so uh, if you need the big boy cuff, just use the big boy cuff because we wanna get an accurate reading on your blood pressure. So there was some new guidelines that were uh, uh, kind of passed out, oh gosh, year and a half ago now looking at blood pressure, and, and I think for, the, for a long time, you know, 120 over 80, that's the number you kind of have to remember, uh, was considered to be under control over here, 120 over 80. Now, before the new recommendations, uh, borderline blood pressure was considered here at one, uh, 130 over 39. So they've changed the recommendations a little bit so if you're 120 over 80, you should have a healthy lifestyle and just get it checked. If you're 120 to 129, they now consider that to be in the borderline range, but it's not necessarily recommended that you have to go on medication at that point, just to get your lifestyle together and reassess it in three to six months. So what we've kind of come down on is anything over 130 over 80 is we usually think about treating that, okay? Again, I'm not gonna go throw you on medicine because you had one reading that was over 130 over 80, okay? Um, certainly if your bottom number, which is your diastolic number, if that's kind of living over 80 most of the time, then you wanna think about maybe doing something about that. And I would certainly say if you're consistently, after you've checked your blood pressure many times, uh, over one, 130 or over, you talk with your doctor about treating it. Certainly with numbers 140 over 90 is too high. So what I want you to kind of remember, of course, is the classical 120 over 80. 
The other number I want you to remember is kind of 130 over 80. That's kind of where, hey, maybe I should talk to my doctor. Should I do something about this? All my blood pressure readings have been high. I like people to keep track of their blood pressure at home. Almost everybody that shows up in my office, their blood pressure's up, you know? I don't wanna be here, I'm aggravated, I'm nervous, I'm, I'm, you know, whatever I am, and my blood pressure's up. So I don't like to make a lot of recommendations based off of that one blood pressure in my office. Now, if you show up in my office and your blood pressure's 200 over 100, we'll do something about that. But it's much more important is what is your blood pressure out in your daily life? Let's keep a trend of it and let's see where we are. But certainly, if it's greater than right in here, something needs to be done about it. Now remember, it's normal to have a 10 millimeter difference between either arm. So you check it in the right arm one day and left arm the other day. If there's 10 millimeters difference between the number, that's perfectly normal. Now, if you start finding a 20 millimeter, 30 millimeter, 40 millimeter difference between two arms, hey, it's 120 over here, but it's 160 over here, trust me, the 160 is correct, and we gotta figure out why you're 120 in that arm, okay? So if you find big differences between your arms, we need to talk about that. Again, wrong cuff size, uh, I did it again. Can you go back? Sorry, my clicker button, it's not working, it's very good. Go back. Back, not forward. There we go, all right. So, wrong cuff size, make sure you have the right cuff size. Normal blood pressure for your blood pressure to go up with activity. So when you go out, run around, do whatever you're gonna do for that day, Come back in and relax before you check your blood pressure. Certainly there are variations with age and with certain medical conditions. As we age, our blood, pressure, our blood vessels get a little stiffer, unfortunately, and blood pressure tends to go up. As we age further, sometimes our metabolism slows down and now you don't need quite as much medicine. So those are things that we have to watch out as we go through the aging process. Why control your blood pressure? Because in general, you don't feel it. Now, certainly there's people in the room who know when their pressure's up. They'll say, my pressure's up. Or they'll turn red, or they'll get a headache, or, or whatever. But in most people, they may not necessarily even know that their blood pressure's up. And it's called the silent killer because you, lots of times you just don't have any symptoms, yet your blood pressure's up. It increases your risk of heart attack, stroke, and kidney disease, all three of those things. So it's really one of the most important risk factors that we can adjust to help lower your risk of heart attack, stroke, and kidney disease. Certainly, a healthy lifestyle helps. Be active, eat right. In some people, they need to watch their salt intake. So all these things can be discussed with your doctor. How do I do best at if I have to take medicine, fine, but what else can I do to have a healthier lifestyle that might help me get my blood pressure under control? All right, the other biggie that we always concentrate on is cholesterol. So what level your cholesterol should be is based on your level of risk. So we'll explain this in a second. The question is, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve primary or secondary prevention. What does that mean? Primary means I don't have heart disease, I've never been diagnosed with a heart problem, I don't have blocked arteries, I've never had a stent, I've never had a bypass, I just wanna know what I can do to help prevent me from having to have that. So that is primary prevention. Secondary prevention means I've had a heart attack, I've had a stent, I've had a bypass surgery, I've had blockage in my legs, and so secondary prevention means we're trying to prevent a second episode of what you've already had. Certainly, other disease states can affect the level of your cholesterol. And I wanna to touch briefly, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on medicines, but there are certain cholesterol medicines that actually lower your long-term risk. Now, this is a really busy slide, and I'm not gonna walk our way through it, so the recommendations recently all changed around a little bit, but certainly 
we want to look at primary prevention. So this is the primary prevention slide. Age 0 to 19, 20 to 30, and 40 to 75. And we want to look and see uh, what should we do. So if you have LDL, so let's, let me take a break real quick. So I don't care what your total cholesterol number is, okay? When you get your cholesterol checked, they're going to give you four numbers generally. They sometimes will send off a really fancy one that's got like 16 pages on it. But in general, you're going to get four numbers. You're going to get your total cholesterol, you're going to get your HDL, your LDL, and your triglycerides. Those are the four. The total cholesterol is made up of the other three. So that's why the total cholesterol really isn't that important because the HDL, high density, that's the protective cholesterol. That actually helps, that's cholesterol being collected from your body to be eliminated. So if your HDL is high, that means your body's trying to eliminate extra cholesterol. So there's a lot of people in, probably in the room, women are actually better at it than men, of having a high HDL. So a high HDL can be protective. The LDL, the low density, that's the sticky stuff. That's the thing that wants to gum up your arteries and, and, and cause heart attacks and things like that. And so, uh, and then the triglycerides, that probably is a kind of a transport form of fat. And that has a lot more to do with our activity level and our diet. So things like carbohydrates and things like that will make our triglycerides go up. And that's why we see in diabetics, diabetics because they have a lot of extra sugar running around, their triglycerides will tend to be higher. So I don't care about total cholesterol. What I really care about is what's your LDL. And if you have a high HDL, that's good. If you have a low HDL, it's not as good. So if you have an LDL, one more side before we get to the numbers. For years, the recommendation for your LDL, your bad cholesterol, was 130 or less. That's one of the numbers I want you to remember. So if you didn't have any heart disease, we want your LDL to be below 130. Now, if you have heart disease, we want your LDL to be more like 70. So those are the kind of two numbers. If you don't have any heart disease, LDL below 130. If you've had heart disease, then we want it to be closer to 70, okay? Although the most recent recommendations from American Heart Association don't even give you a number, they say lower at 50% from where you started. So some of this can be, is a little bit confusing. So I think we look up here. If your LDL is 190 to start, you need to go on statins. If you're diabetic and between ages 40 and 75, you also should start statin. Uh, and then if you're 40 to 75 and your LDL is more than 70 but less than 190, we'll just look at this one right here, then what is recommended is you look at people's other risk factors and see if they're low risk, borderline risk, intermediate, or high risk. And then you kind of make the decision of what you should do. And so you'll say, well, what, what, what things increase my risk? So family history of heart disease, LDLs that are over 160, kidney disease, um, inflammatory diseases, different ethnicities, uh, and then looking at some of these other markers, triglycerides, CRP, LP little a, again, you kind of, I'll show you a little worksheet that your doctor can use to do your risk assessment. So if you are between 40 and 75, your LDL is between 70 and 190, you do a 10 year risk assessment and then you can decide should you go on medicine. So if you're low risk, it's felt that you shouldn't necessarily go on medicine. Maybe you should here, Certainly, if you have intermediate or high risk, you should start on medication, okay? So, uh, it, the thing about this slide is it is somewhat confusing and there's so many little roads. Mm -hmm. So I think this is very much a place where it's good to talk to your doctor. Because I think a lot of times what happens is you go see your doctor, 
you go get your cholesterol checked and they send you a paper and then it says good or bad you know and I don't I want you to kind of understand what that means um, so I think you know particularly if you're gonna work your way through a worksheet like this saying hey doc okay my numbers are out here my numbers between here where do I fall in here and then have a discussion about whether you should start some medication or not okay now this is the secondary prevention slide so this means everybody in this group has had some sort of event stent heart attack bypass whatever and so uh, if you're less than 75 years old certainly uh, medicines particularly statins are indicated if you're greater than 75 <laughs> I'm sure there's some people greater than 75 in the room. And I was like, hey, I'm not listed up there, and I'm greater than 75. There is some controversy, and I don't mean to be morbid, but I want to be truthful. There is some controversy about should we continue cholesterol in patients over 75? Is the risk-benefit ratio what it should be? And, um, and you know, is this is the morbid part, you know, is the patient going to die of something else before their heart disease might get them? So if you're over 75, it, it, it is something you should talk to your doctor about. I think it's very individual. You know, certainly if, uh, you, know, um, you know, you're living a normal, active, healthy lifestyle, I think, and you're 85 years old, you know, I, I don't really see a problem with, hey, if you're 85 now, you've got a chance to live to 100, let's do it without a heart attack, let's treat it. But I think it becomes very individual at that point. So at age greater than 75, it's felt to be reasonable to continue the medicine if they're already on it. It's reasonable to put them on high intensity statin if they're very functional. Uh, so really in this group, um, almost everybody's on treatment and your goal in general is 70. If you're on treatment and your LDL is still greater than 70, there are some new drugs on the market now. They're these injectable cholesterol medicines. Um, they're very expensive, but they will get your LDL down into the 20, 25 range. So um, it's reasonable to take them. But again, I think a lot in here is, hey, doctor, I need extra. What I want you to remember is if you have had some sort of heart event, your number is 70, okay? If you've not had a heart event, then it becomes more negotiable, and it's more now, so where it used to be 130, your number was 130, now if your LDL is between 70 and 190, you need to do a risk assessment if you've never had a heart problem, okay? So really, it's two groups. I've had a heart problem, I've not had a heart problem. I have the number 70 over here. I haven't, then you need to do a risk assessment and see where you are. And so this is these uh, new fancy things you can get on your app and then, you know, on your phone. And so basically this is the way you can calculate 10 year risk score. You don't need to remember all of these individual things, but this is what your doctor would do. It's very quick. It's a, usually on your phone, and you put in all these numbers, and it'll spit out what your 10-year risk of, uh, of heart disease is. All right, so that's cholesterol. I got three more quick ones for you. So the one I want to talk about in relation to diabetes is your hemoglobin A1C. So measurement, I know all the diabetics in the room, we're checking our blood sugar four times a day. We're getting our hemoglobin A1C checked every three months. Um, but this really pertains to the control of your diabetes. Now remember, blood sugar tells you what your blood sugar is right then. Hemoglobin A1C is kind of your tattletale measurement. It kind of tells you where your blood sugar's been over the last few months. So when we go, hey, my blood sugar's great. It's 101 today. But the hemoglobin A1C will tell you if it's been 101 all the last three months or not. So the reason we, we care about it from a cardiovascular standpoint 
is this diabetes is such a major risk factor for coronary disease and stroke. It's part of the big five. The big five for heart disease. Diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, family history, smoking. Those are the big five risk factors. Can't do anything about your family history, but if you're diabetic, you can take care of your blood sugar. If you have high blood pressure, you can get it under control. If you have cholesterol problems, we can get it down with medication or lifestyle. And if you smoke, you can quit. So for those five, there's something we can do something about. And so hemoglobin A1C kind of tells us about your blood sugar. So a normal hemoglobin A1C, ignore these numbers, these are used in Europe. This is the numbers we use here. A normal hemoglobin A1C is 4.0 to 5.9%. Pre-diabetics are considered 6 to 6.4, and anything over 6.5 is considered to be diabetic if they check your hemoglobin A1C. Now, for years, a well-controlled diabetic was felt to have a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 to 7.5, anywhere in that range, and you would have been felt to have been under good control. So, of course, because this is what we do in medicine, you know, every few years we have to change the numbers so that we don't know where our targets are. Um, but if you look on this slide, so here's four different groups that have made recommendations about blood sugar. Uh, American College of Physicians, American Diabetes Association. So the most recent ones came from American Diabetes Association in 2019, and they felt that healthy older adults, everything's working good, you're living an independent life, as long as your hemoglobin A1C is below 7.5, you are felt to be well controlled. So 7.5 is kind of the number you need to re re uh, remember. So down here, you see other groups say, oh, 7 to 8%. Now, in people who are older, but a little more frail, they have multiple, multiple medical problems, it's actually felt that we should not work so hard getting their blood sugar down so closely. So for many years ago, there was a lot of controversy about how tight should your diabetes control be? Should we be super, super aggressive so that your diabetes is you know, really not down. And it turned out that there was more complications when you were overly aggressive with the sugar. They were doing this in ICU patients to control their blood sugars, and, and they were having worse outcomes. So there has been some appreciation recently that maybe we shouldn't be quite as aggressive, that we have to force your hemoglobin A1C down to a five. Now, if you're diabetic and you have an A1C that's five, fantastic. But we probably should be a little looser in our hemoglobin A1C, less than 7.5 for, for healthy folks. People that are a little more frail have other medical problems, probably somewhere less than eight to 8.5. So those are the numbers I want you to remember. All right, two more quick ones, ejection fraction. If you've ever been in the hospital, or you've come to see us, and you'll, we'll say, oh, let's get an echocardiogram, and we'll say your ejection fraction is so-and-so percent. I'm not sure people really understand what ejection fraction means. So what it really is, is it describes the power of your heart. Jeff, who's my uh, nurse practitioner, likes to call it the horsepower. And I think that that's right. What's the horsepower of your heart? Um, and so, what it does is it's telling us what the pumping power is, particularly of the left ventricle. That's the pumping chamber that sends the blood out into your body. A normal ejection fraction is 50 to 60%, okay? So, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a patient's room and I said, I checked your echo and your ejection fraction 60% and a look of horror came on their face. <laughs> 60%, you know, because their feeling is, oh, it should be 100. So it's not 100%. An ejection fraction of 100% is absolutely abnormal. No one ever has it. So a normal ejection fraction is 50 to 60%. 
certainly what it does is it describes the amount of blood that's ejected with each beat. So if your heart fills up with blood, we measure how much blood is left in there after your heartbeat. That's your ejection fraction, the amount from when it's full to the amount after it beats. So your heart never completely empties out. If it emptied out, it would be like this. It would be like a balloon without any air in it. You could never open it back up. So what we want is 50 to 60%. When the ejection fraction is not normal, that's when we start talking about heart failure. Oh, it worked. So this is a, an echocardiogram. This is what we see when we order an echo or an ultrasound of your heart. This big chamber right here is your left ventricle, the pumping chamber out to your body. That's the left atrium. That receives the blood, oxygenated blood back from your, uh, your lungs. Right ventricle, right atrium. And as you can see the walls, if you look really close, you can see how those walls are all coming in together. So that's a normal ejection fraction, a normal power to the heart. That's the mitral valve, and that's called the tricuspid valve. Now this is an abnormal ejection fraction. As you can see, the portions of the wall that kind of come in are only right there. This wall is actually moving to the left. It's not squeezing in, it's moving out. And this area doesn't really squeeze much at all. So this patient had had a heart attack in their LAD, the artery that goes down the front of their heart, and, and the, the front of this patient's heart is not working. So this person's ejection fraction is about 25 or 30 percent. Uh, and the other reason I know it, if you see this white line that runs right there, that's the wire for their defibrillator. So people that have weak ejection fractions will sometimes have a defibrillator to protect them. So that's what that's what we're looking for when we're looking for ejection fraction. This is definitely abnormal, less than 50% and more like 25%. So certainly that patient might have symptoms of heart failure. So this is what it kind of looks like. This is a, a cartoon showing the normal heart. And then this is showing what happens when the ejection fraction is not normal. That the, the pumping chamber starts to dilate, it gets bigger than it is over here. And because it doesn't have as much horsepower, it can't shoot the blood back up out of the body like it needs to. And so what can happen is that fluid can start to back up in the system. You can get some fluid on your lungs, you get short of breath, you find it hard to lay down flat, you, your ankles might start to swell, things like that. Those are can be signs of heart failure. So the last thing I want to talk about is your aorta. The aorta is the largest artery in your body. It starts right at your heart and delivers blood to your entire body. So blood comes into your left ventricle, the heart squeezes it out, and it sends it through the aorta. There is a thoracic part, that means in your chest. There's an abdominal part. Unfortunately, the aorta can be prone to a disease called aneurysm. So this is what the aorta looks like. This is without the heart. So the heart would be hanging down right from here. That's the aortic valve. This is the ascending aorta. It gives off this artery here, which is your right carotid. Your right subclavian goes to your right arm. Your left carotid goes up here to your brain. Your left carotid goes to your left arm. <coughs> And then it kind of comes down and doesn't have a lot of branches. And then it comes down here. These are your renal arteries, feed your kidneys. And those arteries on the, fr front, on the front actually feed your guts. So that's the celiac, sphere mesenteric, inferior mesenteric. That feeds all your stomach, intestines, liver, all those kind of things. And then finally down here in your pelvis, kind of about at the level of your belly button, it splits into two parts the uh, left common iliac and the right common iliac. That one goes to your left leg, to your right leg, and then there's some branches in there that uh, go to the pelvic organs. So that's a pretty normal looking aorta with its branches. Now, where we really tend to talk about aneurysms is in the abdomen, and you may have heard of a condition called triple A, AAA, 
which stands for abdominal aortic aneurysm. Now, you can get aneurysms anywhere through your aorta. Certainly, if you have one in the ascending aorta, just above the heart, that's really kind of a surgical problem. It takes surgery to fix that. You can get them in the descending portion up in your chest, and for years that was treated with surgery, chest surgery, but now they're starting to put some stents and things in there. And, but the far, by far and away, the most common is the abdominal aortic aneurysm. So you can see, this is your aorta coming down. There's the iliacs to your legs. This blue one in the back, that's called your vena cava. That's actually a vein. So the artery, anything is called an artery if the blood is going away from your heart. It's called a vein if it's coming towards your heart. So the blood is delivered through the arteries to your feet, you get the oxygen, the poorly oxygenated blood comes back up these veins to your inferior vena cava and back to your heart to be oxygenated again. So this is a pretty normal looking thing. So, generally, the normal diameter of your abdominal aorta, anywhere from 1.6 to 2.2 centimeters, or if you like millimeters, 16 to 22. That can vary a lot based on your size. My suspicion is that my abdominal aorta is far larger than everyone else's in this room. And so even measurements up to three, 30 millimeters or three centimeters. But if you wanna remember a number, the best number kind of for your, uh, uh, your abdominal aorta is 2.2 to 2.5. That's pretty normal. Aneurysms uh, occur, much greater risk of aneurysms in your belly than up in your chest. 1.5% uh, of deaths in men age 65 to 85 due to aneurysm disease. So this is not a rare, necessarily, disease. This is what an aneurysmal aorta looks like. So you can see the aorta is pretty normal size up here. You can see it bulges out here, then it really starts to bulge out right there. And even goes down into this iliac artery. So you see the size of this iliac compared to this iliac. So this is an abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is the same patient, just looking from the side. So you can see the same arteries up here are those. This is the SMA that goes to your guts. And you can see where the aorta is fairly normal size, and then you have two distinct bulges that are the aneurysm. So what's the problem of an aneurysm? Once they reach a certain size, they have a tendency to want a rupture. And generally, if you have a ruptured aortic aneurysm, it's a near fatal event. Um, not 100%, but close. So if you have an aneurysm, it's something that needs to be watched closely. And if it starts to grow, it needs to be dealt with. This is not a benign disease. Uh, aortic aneurysms can hurt you. So back in the day, the way they used to uh, fix them is they cut you from about right here to about right there, and then open you up, and your aorta actually lives all the way back right in front of your spine. So they have to take all your guts, move them out of the way, fix your aneurysm, put your guts back in, tie you back up, and you'd spend a week or 10 days in the hospital. I mean, it was a big, big surgery. They still do a few of those, but not many, because with current technology, what they can do now is put a stent into your aorta. It's, a, it's like a stent you would put in the heart, but it is covered with some some fabric, and they run a catheter up into your aorta, and they lay this stent in there. You can see the stent got laid in here, and it basically makes a new pipe. So it doesn't cut the aneurysm out, it just excludes it. It forces the blood to go down through the new pipe, and then they run these down into your iliac arteries, and so that's what it looks like in your body. But it's all done right through your legs, kind of like we would do a, a uh, an arteriogram, but these catheters are a little bit bigger. So this tends to be the world where vascular surgeons do these kind of things. But, so it's a very fixable thing now, 
But we kind of need to know if we've got it in the first place. They tend to be painless. When they start to cause pain, it's getting a little late in the game. So, if you look at the risk of rupture of a triple A, as you can see, if you're, as long as you're kind of less than three, you're good. Three to 3.9, zero percent risk of rupture. At four to 4.9, one percent, very low. But once you start getting over five, and in some, most cases, there's another paper that split this out. Five zero to 5.5, .5, was okay, but once you get 5.5 and above, your risk starts to go to 10%, to 20%, to near 50%. So you say, well, how, how will I know if I have a, a, a AAA? Um, so it, it can be screened for very easily by an ultrasound. And actually, in most patients, don't quote me completely on this, but in most patients, when you first get onto Medicare, Medicare, will pay for your first screening AAA ultrasound. So um, you just need to ask for it if you're of Medicare age. Certainly people that need to be screened um, are pe people who have a family history of aneurysms, and certainly it's more common in smokers than it is in non-smokers. Doesn't mean that non-smokers can't get it, it's just less frequent. So what can you do? Get screened if you're at risk, quit smoking, and get your blood pressure under control. So your number that you've got to remember here is 2.5, and if you and if you want to take it out to 3.0, that's fine. Once you find that you have an aneurysm, you will get an ultrasound year over year over year. So, but you've got to get that first one to check and make sure that you're not developing an aneurysm. So, those are the numbers that I think are important for you to know, and I'm happy to take any questions from the from the crowd if you have any. Yes, ma'am. I realize you're not a diabetic specialist, but I'm curious. Um, when I was diagnosed with diabetes 25 years ago, I was running blood sugars in the 500 level. So definitely diabetic. Yes. No questions asked. Now, over the years, I was on medication got my blood sugars under control. I am off medication. I have an A1C that is 5.7 or mm -hmm. something. And people tell me, oh, you're not diabetic. And I say, oh, yes, I am, because if I get sick, if I have yeah. any kind of crisis, my blood sugars will skyrocket again. Why are they telling patients that they are not <laughs> diabetic when they are well controlled? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so it's controversial to, if you could ever say to somebody, you're not diabetic anymore. Yeah. You know, I think the physiology is still there. I think mm -hmm. you're still diabetic. I, I, I think you have to treat yourself, and us as physicians need to treat you as a diabetic. Yeah. This is, so you are in that risk group. Mm -hmm. It just happens to be controlled. And you know, there's really two reasons, two main reasons why people become diabetic. Either their pancreas doesn't make insulin, or far more commonly, you become resistant to insulin. So your, your pancreas spits it out, but your cells don't react to the insulin. And so there's all these different medications to make you more sensitive to your, to your insulin. So, you know, I think over time, what can happen is your insulin sensitivity might change. And certainly as we age, and we see this a lot, patients who have been on large doses of insulin over time uh, they get a little older, their kidneys aren't quite as efficient as they used to be, now the insulin hangs around a lot longer, and so as our physiology changes, um, we may become more sensitive to the insulin going forward. But I don't think that means that your diabetes went away. You're just well controlled. I would agree with you. Yeah. Okay, any yeah. other questions? Okay. Ma'am? Discuss cholesterol and the diet. And the diet. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let, let's enter a little more controversy these days, you know? So um, cholesterol is, yes, it is in your diet. So I do think diet is an important component of treating your cholesterol. Now, if you look at the studies that have been done over the last 20 years, 
the average amount somebody can get their cholesterol down uh, with diet and exercise alone is between 8 and 13 points. Now, you've got to take the study for what it is. You know, maybe some people are really good at following their diet, other people aren't. So I think you have to look at it from an individual basis. If you're trying to get your LDL down from 190 to 100, probably you're not going to be able to do that with diet alone. Um, now, what kind of diet should you eat? You know, certainly the, uh, the heart healthy diet that has been promoted for years is a low fat, um, you know, kind of whole carbohydrate, you know, whole carbohydrate type foods uh, um, and a moderate amount of protein. What is becoming more popular now are these other diets which are kind of high fat or high protein or kind of moderate fat with good fat. So I, I think what your diet should be is, has become a little more controversial. Certainly do I think you need to avoid saturated fat. Saturated fats are bad. Nobody would disagree with that. Things, animal fats, you know, found in red meat, things like that. Fried foods, those probably still fall off the list of being good for your heart. Now, can you get away with eating a high protein, good fat diet, meaning plant-based plant fats? Yeah, and there is some evidence. There's a guy named Arthur Agustin who He's a cardiologist in Florida. He's the guy that came up with the calcium scan for your heart arteries. He designed a diet that was uh, high in protein, low in carbohydrates, and had a moderate amount of good fat. That fat came from like olive oil, canola oil, and fish. And he found that those patients' cholesterol um, dropped dramatically. Uh, they also tended to lose weight. So he decided to write a book and he called it the South Beach Diet and made a million dollars selling books, but he designed the diet thinking this is going to help my heart patients because he was a cardiologist. And so maybe there is some data now coming out that this kind of high protein, low carbohydrate, only eat good plant-based fats may be helpful. And if you look at the data on diets over the years, the one that always seems to come out winning is the Mediterranean diet. Those folks you know, a lot of olive oil, um, a lot of fresh vegetables, but they also eat a lot of olives and things like that. And, and that diet seems to be the best, both at cholesterol control and um, they have low, low uh, incidence of heart disease. So I don't think it's quite as clear as it was. I do think diet plays a role. I also feel like genetics plays a certain role. You know, people have a certain ability to kind of manage their cholesterol so their liver is going to do what the liver is going to do, you know? So uh, it's a little, I think it takes all of it. I think you have to be active. I think you need to eat right. And if you need to take medication to get your cholesterol where it needs to be, I think we should not be so hesitant to take medication because medications have been shown to actually lower our long-term risk of heart, heart disease. All right. One, one, one more. Yeah. If you got a fat or a stem, is it completely eliminated the winter? For the most part, yes. Okay. Uh, so you have to you have to image it every once in a while. It, so you know those things sometimes can leak a little bit. So if they leak around the edges, uh, you can get what's called an endo leak. So. You know, when they put these things in there, they're not putting it in the nicest, perfect, you know, tube in the whole world. You should see there are sometimes all bent like this, and so they're kind of forcing this big stent into this heavily diseased artery. So usually it fits very nicely and very tight, and the aneurysm tends to kind of shrink around the graft. But occasionally up near the edges and things, you can sometimes get what's called an endo leak. And so that means some of the blood can, can, uh, can leak around the outsides of the graft. And that can be seen with imaging, whether that's a CAT scan or an ultrasound. And so as long as the aneurysm is not kind of growing back, um, then you're fine. Sometimes they have to go in and put another stent to kind of uh, seal the leak. But yes, 
if you had a seven centimeter aorta and you got a stent put in, your rupture risk goes way back down. Okay, Ms. Brown, you had a question. I want to ask the difference between chest wall pain and heart pain. Okay. You know, I have, I have PVC, and I sometimes get the pain up to my chest. Yeah. Severe here. So, <laughs> you brought up one of the hardest parts of my job, <laughs> is to look somebody in the eye and say, that's not your heart, that's your chest wall. Um, so, let me give you some of the things that would help you to differentiate. So, chest wall pain means it's something in your chest wall, whether that's a bone, a muscle, a cartilage, that gives you some discomfort. Uh, chest pain due to your heart is because for some reason your heart's not getting enough oxygen down through the plumbing. Heart pain tends to be exertional. Uh, so you get chest pain, you can get shortness of breath. It tends to be kind of reproducible. Every time I walk 100 feet, I get that discomfort. Because if it's due to a blockage, you, um, you know, uh, that blockage is always there. So, hey, every time I walk 100 feet, I'm getting this discomfort. And now it's a month later, now I only have to walk 50 feet and I'm getting that discomfort, now only 25 feet. And so it tends to be progressive and it tends to be reproducible. Heart pain, now in women, women may not necessarily feel it in their chest. Women will frequently feel it in their shoulders, their neck and their jaw. But heart pain doesn't change with position. You can't say, oh, if I switch to my left side, I feel better. That's not, heart pain is not like that. Uh, heart pain generally doesn't change with a deep breath or exhalation. Um, it, it just kind of occurs. Now, certainly people that wake up in the middle of the night, oh my gosh, my chest pain's woke me up in the middle of the night, you know, that needs attention to, be, to make sure that it's not. Chest wall pain tends to be random. It tends to be positional. It tends to get worse when you take a deep breath or not a deep breath. So, you know, those are the gross generalizations about the two.